and welcome back to Consumer Choice Radio, broadcasting across North America and right there on your podcasting app, Podcasting 2.0. Very delighted for our next guest and our next conversation. We're speaking with Chris Becker. He's a co-founder at the Honey Bee Collective, employee-owned sustainable cannabis and the best cannabis under the sun. Chris, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. So the Honey Bee Collective is a very interesting project. Uh, you're someone who is very familiar with the cannabis space. You've worked in uh, all different parts of it across the country. Uh, to give our listeners a bit of a, an introduction, what is the Honey Bee Collective, and how are y'all different than so many other cannabis companies out there? Yeah, thanks for asking. So the Honey Bee Collective is a sustainable cannabis brand we want to uh, our mission is to create community wealth and a sustainable future um so when i say a sustainable cannabis brand i mean sustainable economics and sustainable environmental impact um we source cannabis from growers that meet our standards for both environmental and economic impact so um Cannabis can be grown in ways that's not very good for the environment. So the green rush isn't always so green. Um, There's a lot of carbon output, a lot of electrical usage, a lot of chemical usage in a lot of grow operations that um, we uh, we source from growers that that uh, use earth friendly practices, preferably regenerative. So um, really uh, stuff that feeds back into the earth um, and, and, and uses full circle uh, kind of economics and, and low to no waste uh, uh, kind of processes. Um, and we're uh, employee owned and guarantee all of our employees a living wage. So um, another problem in the cannabis industry that I experienced from my work was a uh, lot of low wages, a lot of, um, uh, la- lack of opportunity for employees to move up, very definite ceiling for employees, and they weren't often becoming owners, um, and a lot of well-documented lack of uh, diverse ownership in the industry. Um, a-, a study just came out that uh, uh, there's like le- less than 2% Black ownership in, in the cannabis industry here in the U.S., um, and so uh, th- th- these kind of cycles of uh, sort of, uh, I don't know, economic oppression, if you will, have been playing out that, you know, w- have been present in other industries, but I, I was hopeful wouldn't play out in cannabis. And so we, we, we've kind of tried to create a business model to stand in contrast to typical extractive, abusive capitalism. All right. Uh, we've plenty to talk about there. Uh, that's at honeybeecollective.com. You guys can uh, check that out. Uh, obviously, Colorado, uh, first U.S. state to legalize. Uh, David and I have been watching. Uh, I've been able to visit, sample uh, some of the dispensaries where it was legal, because obviously local jurisdictions do have some say. Um, how would you say the, the legalization and regulation process has rolled out in Colorado, especially when you compare it to some of the other states who've join the fold like Illinois, Washington, Oregon, and uh, California? So Colorado was the first state to ha- uh, legalize recreational cannabis. And um, by necessity, most of the business was, businesses were vertically integrated, but rather small. Um, the, the state did not allow uh, residents outside the state to bring a lot of capital in for, uh, up until about two years ago. So it was really a breeding ground for um, small businesses and um, a lot of competition in terms of uh, both price and quality. Uh, it, re- it really bred a, a strong market that's great for consumers. Um, and, and so I, I, I'm really happy about the way Colorado has rolled out legalization. There are, there are things to complain about for sure, but relative to some of the other states that you mentioned that are... Um, really kind of dominated by corporate uh, multi-state operators that um, are publicly traded companies and not a lot of small business in those markets. Colorado has a lot by contrast. And on, on that note, um, uh, and on, on that note, what, um, 
Why do you think that some of the other states who have legalized, or even if we look at Canada, maybe missed or ignored some of those successes in in Colorado? Um, and I ask that just because I we spent a lot of time talking to Canadian legislators, explaining to them what were good models and what were not. And it seems like they replicated a lot of the bad ones. But I'm curious as to why you think that the Colorado experience or model maybe hasn't gotten the hype it deserves. Um, well, so the- <laughs> success depends on who is defining it right and so um i I think that uh just to to put it plainly corporate profiteers saw an opportunity to dominate certain markets via exclusive limited licensure and they they thought that that would be better for their uh returns and for the most part they've been right um and uh it allowed companies to enter a market with limited competition. And so there was, there was a strong, um, strong push from, from corporations and their lobbyists to not go the kind of small business friendly model that Colorado went. And, you know, in, in fairness, um, the, the way Colorado structured it, kept a lot of businesses small it kept them kept kept owners from selling out for a number of years um it kept people from realizing like the entirety of the opportunity that existed so um that and it a limited license model um is favorable to prohibitionists and we still have a lot of prohibitionists in power in the u.s especially in less liberal states like Chicago, or I mean, like Illinois and Arizona and uh, uh, Pennsylvania and such, where they've gone with limited licenses that um, e- easier to get conservatives to support um, a, a, a small, well-defined, limited market versus sort of what what they call the wild west of cannabis when when states, yeah. Yeah, and that's kind of always struck me as such a strange, um, a strange conundrum because one would think that once cannabis is legal, Republicans would would want to, or Republicans or conservatives would want to approach it as they do other businesses, which is light touch, let the the market figure it out, let people um, want to enter the market, entrepreneurship, all those buzzwords. So it's it it is it is. I think on point that you 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 highlight that strange anomaly that we've seen both in in the United States and in Canada, where at at some points conservatives have kind of forgotten what their economic worldview was when it comes to the the legal recreational market or even the medicinal market in some southern states. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a real contradiction in terms of philosophy. I I don't really understand how they reconcile it. Um, and I, I think there's also some um, pri- pri- private prison and, and uh, uh, police union um, support that keeps that keeps Republicans from wanting to see a free market in cannabis as well. You know, it, 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 conservatives in the U.S. take a lot of money from companies that uh, either operate private prisons or unions of police officers that, um, quite frankly, don't want cannabis to be legal because they think it'll make their jobs harder. Uh, <laughs> they, they won't be able to use the smell of cannabis as pretext for, you know, human rights abuses. Not wrong. Not wrong. Yeah. And I would say for, uh, for the conservative side, there are, you know, a few, uh, if we look at the, the state of South Carolina, I mean, look, they're just trying to uh, legalize medicinal and uh, it's been an uphill battle. A lot of things with the Republican party there. <laughs> Uh, but I'm wondering your take on any of the federal bills and if you think they're addressing the problems both for you, for you know your employee-owned business, and for your consumers, which I, I've heard you discuss before, that it really should be about the consumers and what they want, not necessarily some you know investment package. Uh, we have seen a number of bills in the Senate. Uh, also, uh, Republican Nancy Mace from South Carolina did have the States Reform Act. A, a bit of a you know Republican-esque, let the states uh, do it, uh, low taxes. 
uh, definitely get rid of all of the different punitive laws on cannabis, uh, remove it from uh, police's hands. Uh, I'm wondering any of your thoughts on some of the federal bills and if they're they're actually addressing the right things. Um, you know, I, I think in theory, uh, Schumer's uh, CAOA act is going to be like what my preference. It's got a high tax burden that's probably unworkable, especially when you're looking to get Republican support for a bill. Um, and, and it makes it really hard for businesses to thrive. And, and, and also, if you keep taxes high, um, reduces the chances that you're going to take market share from the illicit market, which um, is, is tend to, tends to be a stated goal, right? They want to bring, bring people into the regular. Well, I want to see more people brought from the illicit market into the regulated market and for the market to be designed for them to be able to thrive. Um, so in that sense, I don't like the state's reform act because I don't think that the state silos are getting it right uh, in terms of uh, social equity or really for consumer friendly laws. Um, you see a lot of people complaining about prices in a lot of states uh, that have legal markets. Um, so it's not working for consumers and it's not eliminating the illicit market. Um, but it, that 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 could, the same could be said for for the democratic bills that have been proposed with their taxes. So I think the the answer is somewhere in between. Um, but I, I you know I, I lean more towards the bills that are um, aiming for re true restorative justice because um, j j just to stop incarcerating people in my mind is insufficient when. Uh, communities of color have been so significantly harmed by the war on drugs disproportionately to to white folks so um you know i i i i understand it's a divisive issue any kind of restorative justice uh conservatives tend to cringe at i don't quite understand it other than um you know a little bit of white guilt really but um oh yeah and we've uh you know we are on um, more conservative talk radio, but we've actually uh, had people on and we've discussed reparations and restorative justice. And I think these are really important issues, particularly if we want to reach out to as many people as possible instead of cutting off uh, the segments. Uh, one thing that you, you mentioned, uh, some of the localities, the differences in taxation, uh, we would have thought California would have been, you know, this blossoming place. Uh, but I think you mentioned it before, the problem of the illicit market and a lot of communities that have opted out of offering cannabis licenses, you can't have any kind of dispensaries at all. Uh, I mean, are you seeing uh, perhaps some some California tourism of people coming to Colorado? Are you seeing that there are perhaps some entrepreneurs or some, some workers who've left the California cannabis market to come to Colorado because it's a, perhaps a better environment? It's not so significantly better that people are really migrating here. Um, when, when companies are looking to get out of either California or Colorado, I think they are tending to target some of the states that have more limited licenses and, and higher margins, at least for now. Um, so I, I, I haven't seen that, no. What do you think is the, the long-term prospect of, of cannabis being legal coast to coast? It's going to take some time. Um, the, there's there's still a lot of resistance to legalization um you know in turn there, there's a really strong chance that republicans will take control of uh the senate or the house or maybe both um and and possibly that you know then the next presidential election things could flip depending on what the next couple of years look like so if that happens um I don't think you'll see any federal movement in cannabis legalization for a really long time. Um, so you'd still be just looking at state by state piecemeal legislation. Um, and that's, you know, maybe, maybe in 10 years, 12 years, you'd see all states having some form of legal cannabis. Um, I, for, in my mind, the sooner the better. Um, as much as I don't want to compete with Coca-Cola or Unilever or Procter & Gamble with their marketing budgets and product development budgets, um, I think that's when the market will be most normalized, least stigmatized and look best for consumers, which um, I think should, should be a priority.
Well, thank you very much, Chris, for joining us on Consumer Choice Radio. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, all. Appreciate it.